Now, fuel in your fat, you've got fuel in your muscles that can be mm -hmm. burned, and you've got fuel in your liver. It's called glycogen. And mm -hmm. when you wake up early, all of that is as low as it's going to be because you haven't been eating anything. Got gotcha. you. And so if you exercise then, your body starts dropping into your body fat stores quicker. In today's fast-paced world, Dr. Huberman's revelation about morning body fat reduction is truly inspiring. By harnessing the power of our body's natural rhythm, we can achieve exponential fat loss simply by embracing early morning activity. And that's just the beginning. Fat loss is something that interests a large number of people. Many people want to lose fat. Many people are athletes who need to lose fat. And in general, we know that having body fat percentages that are too high is unhealthy for us. And most people struggle to lose fat. Most people struggle to lose weight generally, but most people especially struggle to lose body fat or what we call adipose tissue. Now, this is a huge topic on the internet. There's a lot of controversy. Today, we're going to talk about some things related to fat loss and that are powerful for fat loss that I'm guessing most of you have never heard about before. You may have heard about a few of them, but I'm guessing you haven't heard about all of them. And this is, I think, an important gap that's missing in the discussion about fat loss. You can hear a lot of information out there about the role of things like insulin and various diets like ketogenic diets or vegan diets or Mediterranean diets. And there's some great stuff out there and there's some really terrible information out there and there's a lot of controversy. We did a number of episodes talking about the role of hormones on metabolism and the role of food on mood and well-being. I will touch a little bit on hormones today, things like insulin and leptin, just a little bit, how those encourage or can encourage accelerated fat loss because it turns out they can. Remember, your nervous system, which includes your brain and your spinal cord and all the connections that they make with the organs of the body, governs everything. It's the on switch and the off switch for your immune system. It's the on switch and the off switch, it turns out, also for fat burning. And so the nervous system and the role of the brain and other neurons has been vastly overlooked in the discussion about losing fat. Now, I would be remiss and I'd probably come under a pretty considerable attack if I didn't just acknowledge up front a core truth of metabolic science and also of neuroscience, frankly, which is that calories in versus calories out, meaning how many calories you ingest versus how many calories you burn is the fundamental and most important formula in this business of fat loss and weight management in general. There's simply no way around the fact that if you ingest far more calories than you burn, you're likely to gain weight. And a good portion of that weight is likely to be adipose tissue, fat. It's also true that if you ingest fewer calories than you burn, that you will lose weight and that a significant portion of that will come from body fat. What portion depends on a number of factors, but that simple formula is important. How highly processed foods change the way that we utilize food and can lead to higher incidences of obesity and other metabolic syndromes that go against the idea that a calorie is a calorie and that's it. So a calorie is a calorie as a unit of energy and we need to accept and acknowledge this calories in, meaning calories ingested versus calories burned formula, but the calories burned portion is strongly influenced by a number of things that you can control that can greatly accelerate or increase the amount of adipose tissue or the proportion of adipose tissue that you burn in response to exercise and food. And people ask me this kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. Like, what do I do? How do I sleep better? How do I stop stressing? And usually I find that people are not serious, meaning they, they want an answer, but they don't want to do the work. Right. Yeah. right. So I was like, look, it's really simple. Can you not eat until 2 p.m.? Mm. I was like, yeah. I'm not hungry in the morning. I'm like, great, drink coffee, drink water. And in the morning, get up and just either run or get on some exercise bike and just pedal like someone's chasing you with a syringe full of poison. Right in the morning after when you wake up. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, after a few minutes, okay. you know, give okay. yourself some time, okay. go to the bathroom. So you're serious. No, I have questions yeah. about this Early because day. I'm yeah. the opposite, right? Yeah. I, I, I find it hard for me to gain weight and stuff like that. So please continue right. though. I got a, this question yeah. after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the reason I felt any uh, sense of agency in giving this information is 
yeah, I've done a bunch of different things in neuroscience related to vision and neuroplasticity and stress, but I, I've done some work and continue to do some work with special operations and some of these groups that are interested in how you use biology to improve human performance mm -hmm. over long periods of time. Okay. So, you know, basketball players, you know, yes, military, yes. you know, these kinds of things. And so there's a pretty straightforward formula where when you've been asleep all night, your fuel reserves, like you've got fuel in your fat, you, you guys don't have any of that, but you got fuel in your fat, you've got fuel in your muscles that can mm -hmm. be burned and you've got fuel in your liver, it's called glycogen. And mm -hmm. when you wake up early, all of that is as low as it's gonna be because you haven't been eating anything. Got you. And so if you exercise then, your body starts dropping into your body fat stores quicker. So what I was trying to give Mike was a was a tool that would allow him to see some results really quickly. Oh. So I said, look, do it fasted mm -hmm. and then continue to hydrate and then eat your first meal in the afternoon. And I said, and also, it, you know, do you like drinking? And he was like, well, I don't know. I drink mostly because it kind of sets me straight up here. And I was like, well, we can talk about the stuff to, kind of set your head level. I mean, he wasn't spun out. He just obviously was medicating with alcohol. Sure. Um, I didn't detect anything dysfunctional about him. He was just reporting to me that he wanted some assistance. Right. So I said, you know, would you be willing to drop the drinking or, or you know, pair it back? Yeah. And he said, sure. So, okay, so explain that. And I said, look, and you know, here's my number, just um, for the anxiety and stress management, uh, I'll give you some breathing, some respiration tools that work really well mm -hmm. that are not, you know, woo mysticism. Mm -hmm. It's not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you to meditate 30 minutes a day, although that's a cool practice too. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you some tools you can use in real time as you're working hard and okay. dealing with whatever it is you're dealing with in life. Okay, so that ends, the conversation ends. A year later, Mike reach out, reaches out and says, hey man, thanks for all that stuff you gave me. I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, I lost 60 pounds and I <laughs> haven't had a sip of alcohol since we talked last wow. and feeling pretty good. Damn. And I was like, so how did you do it? I get on the bike and I pedal as hard as I can and like some chasing me with a <laughs> syringe full of poison. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, he remembered. Yeah. You know, and I was so impressed. Like very few people can just take the, the menu and just do it. Go. Right? Right. And maybe it's his Midwest upbringing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did get gifted a but some people yeah. also, I feel like, reach that point in their life where they're like, it's time. This yeah. is, a, right. whether it's smoking yeah. or drinking, like they, you can't quit smoking unless you're mentally prepared to, right? It's like, there's that, that, that switch. Look, I always say, the beauty of being young is that neuroplasticity, your nervous system's ability to change mm -hmm. in response to experience to learn things, mm -hmm. is at its absolute peak. Mm -hmm. However, you don't have that much control over your life when you're young, right? especially when you're really young. As you get older, it gets harder to change your nervous system, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. But the advantage you have is that you can direct exactly what changes you want to happen. Mm. And so there are two different ways to change your nervous system, depending on whether or not you're younger or you're older. And it's not like the gate drops right at 25, okay. it just tapers off. But Mike made the decision and I always say, you, you, if somebody is an adult, you can't change their mind. Right. You literally can't. They have to make the decision to do that. And he flipped the switch. He flipped it. He flipped it and he's still there. And um, I think he feels much better. Yeah. It's strong, how to build muscle mass that like broaden and, and deepen your understanding of that task. It definitely. And I'll do these in bullet points because if people want the logic behind them and the mechanism, they can listen to that episode. Yeah, it's a really good episode. I'll start with heat and cold really quickly and just say that avoid cold immersion. So ice baths and being in cold water up to the neck, uncomfortably cold, within the four hours after a, a training session that's designed to evoke an adaptation, either endurance, hypertrophy, or strength, because the inflammation that you experience from a hard endurance workout or from a hard strength or a hard or hypertrophy workout is the stimulus by that you're going to adapt to. The cold water immersion reduces inflammation and can short circuit some of that. After four hours, you're probably okay, but if you can do it a different day or you can do it before those sessions, that's better. Heat, however, can be done immediately after training and it's probably beneficial because of the way that it dilates the vascular system and delivers, perfuses the muscles and ligaments, et cetera, with more nutrients. And I should just mention yeah. that was 
a crucial piece of information. It's a little bit surprising. Was it surprising to you? Absolutely. Because I actually, the way I posed the question to him about cold was, I hear that getting into an ice bath or a cold water immersion after training can reduce hypertrophy, but I'm guessing it's not that big of a deal. And he said, no, it is a big deal. It will short circuit your progress. Now for people that are only interested in performance, who are doing a lot of workouts and trying to recover, but not trying to grow muscle, get stronger or build endurance, mm -hmm. then it makes sense to do cold. Cause like it, skill development. Or skill development, or you're an athlete in season, pick three exercises, compound exercises, multi-joint uh, movements, do them for, do three to five exercises for three to five repetitions per set, rest three to five minutes and do that three to five times per week. And for details, you can, again, look to the episode, it's timestamped. But what's interesting about this is three to five times a week is a lot for a muscle group. Squatting th five times a week for five reps, meaning you're working pretty heavy, meaning you're close to failure, but not failure for strength generally. People who are training mostly for strength can do these low rep type regimens frequently because most of the adaptation is neural. And because you're not pushing to failure in most cases, you don't get that sore. And so it's the motor neurons getting the muscle fibers to contract more intensely or with more efficiency in other ways that's leading to these strength gains. And this is why power lifters can train every day or five days a week or four days a week. For hypertrophy, the repetition range can be pretty broad. You think anywhere from six to 30 repetitions, you should do 10 sets per muscle group per week, maybe even a bit more. So high volume, high volume, but you have to go to failure or beyond in order to stimulate growth. Why does it work at such a great range of repetitions? Well, there apparently are three ways that you stimulate hypertrophy and maybe more. One is tissue micro damage to the tissue. The other is through some sort of tension based changes in the molecular gene programs of cells that lead to protein synthesis that don't that are distinct from damage. And the other are metabolic effects of like high repetition work of superfusion of the muscle with blood. We know that third category exists because people are now doing this blood restriction training where they cuff off a muscle and they'll use a really light weight. I've done these before. You can use a five pound weight and do curls with this and you're, you are in pain and the muscles are swelling up with blood. It does lead to hypertrophy, but in general, you're not sore. You're not doing tissue damage. And by the way, don't just turn to get it off a muscle because you have to use the proper cuffs um, because you need the blood still to flow in one direction. You can't just cinch it off or you'll, you'll potentially kill yourself if you um, get a clot or you do it wrong. So get the appropriate cuffs, they're out there. And then for endurance, I learned something really cool. So I, I work out basically, I go to the gym every other day on average, I, three or four days a week I do that, but generally not two days in a row. It's workout, next day I'll do cardio, next day. And the cardio for me is always a 30 to 45 minute jog kind of zone two cardio. Andy informed me that to build endurance while building strength and maintaining some muscle size or even building muscle size, I would be wise to take one day a week and add to that all out max heart rate work for 90 seconds at least. So do 90 seconds then rest and then maybe do another 90 second all out sprint. I almost missed my flight going from Los Angeles to Austin. I did that all out sprint in the airport yesterday. So I actually can think it's done for me. So there was a sprinting Dr. Huberman throughout <laughs> with three bags. That's awesome. Cause I travel, I generally, I I'll travel with a, um, too much stuff. Um, I love how you were probably running late for a flight and used that as an opportunity to explore. Well, as I was doing it, I was thinking to myself, okay, Andy, that's a 90 second sprint. Cause I got to the, the security line. I finally got TSC. But that's brief. for better. That's for extending endurance. That's for, yeah, it, it actually has some carryover effects on, on endurance if you're doing the other stuff. And then he also said one day a week to do this workout and I haven't done it yet. Maybe we do it tomorrow. It'd be fun, which is you run a mile. You ask yourself, how long did that take? Let's say it took eight minutes, then you walk or rest for eight minutes, then you run another mile as fast as you can, and then you rest for the equivalent period. And you do that one to three times once per week. So you're, and so as an all around fitness program, it may, you could collapse this into something where you say, okay, you're gonna work out with the weights for about an hour every other day, maybe take two days off every once in a while, maybe not. You're going to do six to 15 repetitions you're gonna to push to failure on some of those, not all, because some of those are designed to build more strength. You're not going to failure and heavier. Some are designed for hypertrophy, higher rep and going to failure. And then on off days, you're gonna jog for 30 to 45 minutes. 
but for two days a week, you're either at the end of your jog or whatever, you're going to do some all out sprints for 90 seconds and then rest and repeat. And for another day, you're going to do these mile repeats. That's a pretty, that's a pretty large chunk of exercise movement. But if you kind of thread through the middle of all that, what you end up with is some decent strength building protocols, some decent hypertrophy, some cardiovascular training that establishes the so-called a base or a so-called base. So you're not going to get really good at anything. You're not going to become a marathoner this way, an optimizing marathon 